auditorium. So glad to be here. My name is Sue Turnbull, and I'm chair of Bad Sydney Festival. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to hand over to Carolyn Ovington, literary editor of The Australian, crime writer, true crime writer, journalist, par excellence, and um, leave you in... Jane's just appeared. She's here. Hello. Hello, Jane. Okay, you can't quite see me, but I'm just introducing Caroline. And Caroline is going to introduce you. We're, we're passing, passing the mic between us as I speak. But hooray, so delighted to see you. And thank you for doing television for us this morning. That was so great. And Caroline, over to you. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you all for coming to the Medcalf Auditorium today. Socially distanced as you are, it's such a pleasure to see people in person. Jane, I'm sorry we couldn't see you in Sydney. The last time I saw you, I think, was in this very room. So it's nice to kind of see you even by TV. I've got a couple of housekeeping things I have to do, Jane. Just bear with me. First of all, an introduction to the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival for 2021. It is terrific to be back in a room with crime lovers in person. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on Zoom. I'm sorry, I can't see you, but I know that you're there and throughout New South Wales who are watching from your local library or else from home. Now, we acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation as the traditional owners of the land, and we pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. As Sue mentioned, I'm Caroline Overington, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to this discussion with Jane Harper, who's joining us from Melbourne. I have a few housekeeping announcements. As you've already seen, we're following the COVID protocols. We're all double vaxxed. We're all checked in with our QR codes. We should keep on our masks, except when eating or drinking. And in the case of the speakers, me, when I'm on stage, um, social distancing means that we're restricted to numbers in this room. So please try to respect those protocols. And hand sanitizer is available at the door. Um, please mute, mute your mobile if you haven't already. And don't record the session. So if you're taking photos, please turn off your flash. Um, feel free to share on social media at Bad Crime Sydney, hashtag Bad Crime Sydney. Um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Jane is fantastic when it comes to questions. She's always got answers that blow the reader's mind. So get your question ready. I'm very happy to come to you. And that'll be about 20 minutes before the end of the session. So because of questions, we won't be handing out microphones for COVID reasons. So please stand up and ask, uh, speak as, as loudly as you can. Please join me in joining Jane Harper. And I'm so sorry about the very long convoluted welcome, but welcome, welcome. Oh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in person even, but it's, it's lovely to be here anyway. It is, it is lovely to see you again. Um, now, I, I know you all know who Jane is, so we, won't, we don't need to recite too much, but she's the, the author of the best-selling crime novels, The Dry, Force of Nature, The Lost Man and The Survivors, sold in more than 30 territories to millions and millions of people. They're excellent books. They really are. They are just sublime. Um, and she's taken Australian literature into places where I think we never imagined that it would go. It is now Australian crime literature that has become a genre bigger than almost anything else we've seen. It's quite astonishing. Um, and it started with Jane. And I think that we understand ourselves better and our nation better because of these books. The last time Jane and I met was actually at this festival, I think in 2019. And since then, I've seen a picture of you with Eric Banner having a bit of a cuddle. So I need to ask you about that. It was top secret last time we met that it was a, the dry was about to be turned into the movie. And it's been so long, Jane. The movie's been on and you've cuddled Eric Banner. So tell us what happened. I have, I have. That's, that's true. I have a photo of it um, saved on my phone at all times, just in case someone should ask to see it, you know. Um, yeah, so the movie came out um, actually, you know, pretty almost a year ago now. It was New Year's Day and... Um, you know, I mean, what a great experience that was. It was, it, I, I was so, I was so delighted with the film. And I think, you know, it, it really captured everything about the book that, that, you know, was really important to me. And I think that readers have responded to and um, the director and screenwriter, Robert Connolly did such a beautiful job. I think of really understanding that heart of the book. And then, you know, you really can't go wrong with someone like Eric Banner kind of, you know, <laughs> you know taking on a title role and 
you know, doing his fantastic things. So, um, I mean, I was just thrilled. I, I loved it. I, I loved seeing it. I love seeing it come together. And I really love seeing the kind of, I guess, the audience response and the really positive feedback from readers, because that was always what was most important to me, that the readers felt like they'd done it justice. So, so tell us, walk us through that process. I think a lot of us came to your uh, written work through the dry. It exploded onto the Australian landscape and then onto the international landscape in such a magnificent way. Everybody I know who read it absolutely loved it and thought you had captured the real essence of Australia and a particular look and feel of Australia. So then how does it feel when somebody comes along and says, look, we'd like to make the movie? Do you think, well this is my book <laughs> how is it going to look or do you hand the whole thing over to them and with with a great amount of faith oh look i mean it is it is a, it is a leap of faith i think really um i mean the 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 drive actually got options before it was even published so you know i was just this kind of like unpublished debut novelist as someone you know at the time it was like Reese with a spoon and Bruno Papandrea who were in this partnership and they kind of got their hands on it and read it so i mean of course you know um, you're going to say yes, you know, because <laughs> why, why wouldn't you? Um, and, but at the same time, I mean, you know, I mean, I worked so hard on that book. Like I really, you know, I mean, I still, I, I still love it. You know, it's still so valuable to me because, you know, it launched my whole career and it, it made everything that's happened since possible because of, you know, the novel, the dry. And um, so, you know, I am really protective of it as well. So it, I, I think, you know, it helps when, you know, you do have faith in the team involved. I mean, I knew like Bruna, Bruna Papandrea is Australian, but she's got a really such a great reputation overseas with, you know, she was behind Big Little Lies and, and Gone Girl and things like that. So she had such a sort of strong reputation that helped. And then um, I knew Robert Connolly really loved the book and, you know, he was quite close to me. So we met up quite a few times to, to discuss things. So that gave me a lot of confidence. And then when I heard that Eric Banner wanted to come on board, you know, I mean, that, you know, I mean, that was amazing, as you can imagine. And so um, I think that really helped. And I was kind of involved. They were really courteous about involving me throughout. So I got to go up and I, I tell a story all the time how I got to go up and be in the film. Like I got to be in the funeral scene, um, you know, as a, as a mourner at a funeral. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't see you in the film. What do you mean you got to be in the film? <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to pause it. Now. Yes, I was. <laughs> I can't believe you missed my my role. Yeah. Um, it's about, it's about like two minutes in, in the funeral, and I'm in the second row, um, playing a, an absolutely convincing, grieving townsperson. So so like, I don't know how you did missed you, it. Did you put that in your contract that I must be in the film or do they make the offer? They, they made the offer. They, they invited me to come along. And then, but then actually they needed, because it was being filmed out in, um, you know, it was filmed out in the regions. Like it was filmed, um, you know, they, they really went out and filmed it out in kind of the, the sort of, um, Western, um, you know, like in Beulah and like the kind of, um, the sort of those country towns that really, I think, captured the essence of the location. But because of that, when you have a big scene where you have a funeral in the wake, you actually need bodies in the church. You know, you need people to fill the seats because there's not maybe a lot of people who are available on a weekday for, you know, eight hours to sit in a church and look sad. So um, I got to bring up like a whole bunch of kind of family and friends. Like my my brother bought his workmate and his son and, you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> so throughout the church is all kind of, you know, my kind of nearest and dearest kind of scattered throughout, giving the, you know, acting the little hearts out. So it was really <laughs> fun. <laughs> That's absolutely sensational. And tell me when, you, uh, when you're writing the book and you already have optioned, well, you've optioned it, and you're a debut author, do you think in your mind how it will look and who will play those roles? Or does that kind of thing come to you and you think, oh yeah, they've got it perfectly right? Oh, look, I, no, I never really did do this kind of fantasy casting, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I found it came on board quite early. So that was sort of fixed relatively early, I suppose. But with the others, I didn't, um, I didn't really have you know, a clear picture in terms of, um, I had a clear picture in my own mind of the characters that I'd written, but I hadn't sort of gone and kind of matched them up with any, you know, particular actors. But I did think the casting was just exceptional. I mean, when I saw the people who'd been cast, um, I mean, even if they didn't exactly match in my own mind, you know, the, the, the physical image, I thought they, they still captured the character so well and I could see it in the, the way they moved and the, the language and the way they interacted with each other. So, I mean, I thought they, yeah, I thought they nailed it. I thought it was really a really kind of strong cast, you know, across the board. 
And one of the things that you're most brilliant at, I think, is detail, the detail that really brings your books to life. Like that I remembered very much that it's description of the primary school in the dry with the with the children's crayon pictures peeling off the walls in in the heat. Like I, I could see it in my mind's eye. And I noticed in the film they went to a lot of trouble with the detail too. In particular, the um the photo album. Do you remember that? That she's looking through, looking back from when they were teenagers. And it could have been a real photograph album from the 1970s. Were you impressed by the the effort that they went to to get all those details right yeah you know it's funny you should mention that because because yes I absolutely was and I think there were so many things as well that um they really could have cut corners on but it's funny you should mention like the, the children's pictures because they actually um I think in the film I'm not sure you even see them actually but I they they went out and um got actual kids to draw these pictures so it wasn't just some intern in the back office scribbling a couple of pictures they actually went and got kids kind of told them you know, kind of gave them a bit of inspiration and told them to draw things. So it was things like that I thought was, you know, quite um, a little, you know, sort of further, you know, further than I would have thought. And the, um, like the order of service at the funeral was a real one as well. Like, again, I kind of would have thought maybe just blank sheet of paper or something, but that was all completely written out. So it was, it was quite moving actually, because it was like being at a real funeral, you know. Um, <laughs> you all your friends and family. <laughs> that's right. And like things Thank like they are- um, Nobody's dead. But, but yeah, but if they had this kind of really moving montage of this, this these actors, this, this whole kind of family of four, you know, on screen with all these, they, you know, then you know, bring out their birthday cake and things, and you're like, oh my god, like it was, it was actually genuinely, it was, it was bizarre to sort of be sitting there in three D, kind of doing this whole, whole thing. Um, so yeah, absolutely, like that level of detail was. Um, I mean, I don't know if they do that on every film. Like I, I've never sort of really had that kind of. Um, first-hand experience before but um, it was way beyond what I kind of expected they would do given the, 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 the amount of stuff they had to do. And my memory of it is that you got a tiny little window when people were able to see it on the screen because between the two COVID lockdowns is that right were you nervous at all for it for its ability to actually get out given the two years we've all had to suffer through? Yeah, I mean, you know, looking back, it was like, it really was a window. I don't, I don't think at the time I kind of totally realised that that window was going to close. So, you know, close again, quite as in the way it did. Um, I think I it was just happy that the, I guess, everybody involved had sort of held on to it until a point where it could be released on, you know, such a great release day, like New Year's Day, and, and people were able to go and see it, enjoy it on the big screen. And so I think I was just, at the time, I was just happy that had come to be. But um, yeah, looking back, you know, it was it was pretty lucky because if they'd held over to like Easter or, you know, anything like that, I think it would have been a very different story. So, um, yeah, it was um, it was a really good outcome. Um, yeah. Looking back. And, and what happens to your book when the film comes out? Do they re-release it with a film cover and do all that kind of thing? And does it enjoy an upswing in sales again? How did that work? Yeah, it did. I mean, exactly. They, they sort of, um, the, the publishers, Pam McMillan, reissued it with the, um, you know, with a, a cover of, you know, Eric Banner looking brooding and, and you know, <laughs> charismatic. Um, and, um, you know, which, you know, unsurprisingly shifted a few copies. So, um, so yeah, so it kind of gets this like second lease of life and you get people who, you know, have, have sort of, you know, seen the film and haven't read the book or have gone along with a friend who's read the book and then they've read the book. And it does get this sort of whole, um, whole new sort of lease which is is quite interesting to see just new people discovering it even after you know five years or whatever it was sure and and the cuddling photo did how did that work did you uh run over to him or did he run over to you <laughs> i think i think we both we both um uh maintained a, a, a sort of a, a a friendly professional distance until the um whoever was in the publicity said and let's get one of jane and eric and then i obviously kind of you know was completely available for that so i <laughs> I, I, I trotted on over there you know, gave him my best smile so um but yeah, it was it was quite interesting because a lot of the stuff was sort of you kind of do it, and then there's this massive like year long gap where they they go away and they edit the film, and everything's just kind of under wraps until you, you know until the publicity starts for real, which was you know like a full oh like it was more than a, way more than a year later, maybe even close to eighteen months, and so you, you kind of do this thing, and then it just sort of goes completely dead for ages. And then all these photos you've forgotten you've ever even taken suddenly emerge and things. So it's quite it's quite strange seeing just the life of it. 
and how it's all come together. And tell us about the last couple of years for you, Jane. So you were writing pretty much a book every year or every other year. And The Survivors is the most recent one that came out. So where are you at in your writing schedule at the moment? So, yeah, so um, I'm on a sort of an every other year um, path at the moment. So I'm just, um, just working on the book five at the moment, um, which I think would, I'd expect that to come out sort of later next year, probably. Um, yeah, sort of towards the end of next year. Um, so it's another Australian mystery, kind of, I think, very similar in tone and feel to the other ones. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm really sort of happy with the way it's coming together. And, um, you know, it's always fun to kind of, I guess it's always fun to start a new project and, and kind of have that whole, just see, I guess, bring the whole thing together and see how it all plays out and things. That's always kind of a, you know, it's always, it's hard work, <laughs> like to be, <laughs> to be honest, but, um, but you know, it's always, it's always sort of, it's fun, you know, I mean, that's, I guess it is fun because that's why I enjoy doing it. And I, I think I read in the Herald Sun that you moved house. And the reason that I knew that you moved house was because they were advertising Jane's apartment for sale as the apartment where she wrote the dry. And then it said, like, maybe you can get your inspiration. And there was a photograph of your of the desk where presumably you did your little notes and so on. It was gorgeous. The real estate, I, the real estate agent could not contain himself with excitement when he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, he, he was, he was like, you know, uh, I mean, you know what they're like. He was a lovely guy, you know. They're always looking for a hook, and he, and 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 this was like, I guess, you know, I don't know. A, it was a really good hook for a real estate agent. So yeah, it was kind of funny seeing that that sort of, um, yeah, been sort of advertised. But it's true. I mean, I did write the book there, and it, it actually, it's it's interesting how many memories that place holds for me because I do remember sitting at the desk you know in the bedroom you know just kind of doing it in my spare time weekends and evenings just kind of writing this book and and honestly thinking so many times like nobody oh nobody will ever read this I may as well just do what I want to do with this story because nobody's ever going to read it so I may as well just write it for myself I suppose. Well, now we know where the apartment is. They can come and put one of those gorgeous little plaques on the front like they do in England. It'll be like on the Melbourne Riders walking tour. It'll be on there. It'll be sensational. One of the things that you just said there about the idea that you thought that no one would read it, I know there's a lot of people watching on Zoom and also in the room who are really keen to be writers themselves and maybe are having that same feeling that, oh, I don't, uh, looking at the blank screen and thinking, where is this story going to go? What advice do you have for them, Jane, if any? Oh, yeah, I mean, God, I could, you know, just, I mean, there's so much that, you know, I'd love to just kind of, I could talk for hours on this, you know, and especially I think being quite fresh in the process myself um, has really brought it all back. You know, sometimes when I get asked that question and, you know, the book's been done for a year and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, just focus and, you know, find the time to write and, you know, sort of, but now, I mean, it's really, it's quite, um, the whole process is really quite raw for me still in that I've, I've just kind of completing it and things. So, um, you know, all those kind of hours at the computer and the, the level of thinking that has to go on, um, is is quite sort of at the forefront of my mind so if you're trying to write and you're struggling you know or feeling like it's kind of never ending like I do I absolutely feel where you're coming from um, and I guess you know I mean there's a few things I mean I've given like a short TEDx talk which is available online um, where I kind of run through the you know the sort of the, the core of that is really the the way that I think a lot of the practical skills that we have in our everyday lives whatever you do for a living or, or you know um studying or whatever you're doing you probably have skills that you can bring to a creative process they're not they're not separated it's it's all things that you can you can draw on um and then I also was doing a, a bit of a series on on Instagram kind of charting the process for this latest book I was working on which um I am actually very if anybody's been following that I I, I apologize I am very aware that I, I jumped from talking about opening chapters to basically having finished the book <laughs> and, and so I probably will go back and fill in some gaps there because there was obviously a bit of a process in the middle but honestly it was because I'd, I'd forgotten that writing a book is so involving you know it just takes up all your time and all your mental energy and I just literally could not I couldn't draw myself out of it enough to do an Instagram. I couldn't explain it, you know, in an Instagram post because I was just consumed by it um, time-wise and energy-wise and everything. And I just had to focus and get it done. So there were some steps in between that, those first chapters in the end. So I'll, um, I'll probably go back and, and try and fill in a few gaps for anybody who has been following it on there. 
Well, I think I saw that TEDx talk because I've never forgotten the brilliant way you described the way you approach your work. And I, and I, I think if I prompt you, you'll remember because you said you start with one sentence and then you bolt on a little bit more detail and then you bolt on a little bit more detail and then a bit more and then you've got a paragraph and then you've got three paragraphs and then you've got a page and you kind of build out in a, in a way that I'd never heard anyone describe it quite like that. Is that still your process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. thank you for kind of summing up like that because that's exactly what happens. Like I, I think, you know, because when people, you know, they ask you like, where do you come up with the ideas? And I mean, it, it's su it's such a layered process and um you know i'm thinking about um like one thing like what is one kind of core what is one core thing that i feel would you know be um you know a, a good thing at the heart of a story like what kind of grabs me and often um i've spoken about this maybe i think elsewhere but i often started the ending as well so i'm kind of looking for that moment where um we're I'm not thinking about like a great opening. I'm thinking more about the ending where people have come together in like an extreme moment of something, you know, an, an accident or an act of violence or a betrayal or whatever it is. Um, and what, what has happened then? And then from there, I'm kind of building out like, well, what's brought them to this moment? Is it something short-term and immediate? Is it been brewing for years? Are there other factors involved? You know, and that's, and it's that kind of start point I'm working out from. So I'm kind of starting at the end and then working out from there, who needs to be involved. If, if these people are involved, who then, you know, would be the main character who would have a perspective on things, who would be able to tell the story in the best way to have that insight that we need. And then who are gonna be the red herring characters and who are gonna be the sort of supporting roles. And you are gradually kind of building them out and building them out. And then really the, the start comes, quite late and then I'm thinking okay so I've got this this kind of events where's the best place to drop the reader in so that um you know it hooks them straight away and what's the most exciting best bit that I can kind of start at and then we can go from there to this ending which is is always kind of what I've had in mind you know it's interesting you talked about place there and you know where is the best place to have this happen I know when you started with the dry, many people were full of praise for the way you evoked the Australian small town. And then with your other books too, I think the Outback, and many people were surprised to find you in this book on the Tasmanian coast, like closer to water. What, what prompted that idea? I think just, you know, when you're looking at settings, you're looking at the setting that's going to support the story best. And, um, and it's, it's really as simple as that in terms of um, trying to think, um, okay, so again, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to this plot where I've got this idea and, and maybe this, this thing has happened. Um, and this thing could probably happen in a few places, you know, whatever it is, you could probably fit it in a few different, different areas or, and I'm not just talking um, kind of geographical, I'm talking like sort of urban or city or within a business or within a domestic situation. So, so you kind of, I'm trying to, make decisions I guess on what was going to um, support the story best and in that you're looking for a landscape that's going to um, I think firstly be interesting you know it's going to give you, you know, something to work with as a writer and keep people engaged and by that I mean the characters will have stuff to do like they'll kind of have maybe kind of slightly I don't know, interesting jobs or conversations that we don't necessarily have on the street in Melbourne um, or they'll have I mean the Lost Man is a good example in the lifestyle that you know it's obviously very out back and they're, they're so remote and um you know how do they even buy their food that kind of thing so, so, so you, and, and you went on an outback journey didn't you to to sort of familiarize yourself with those huge distances was it yeah, the, the Tasmanian yeah. novel did you go and spend time there yeah absolutely so I always try and go um go to yeah go to the place um, or, or places or that kind of region where I want to set it because I think um you know that's that's where you kind of get the stuff that you don't know that you're missing. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of research. I do a lot of research, um, you know, from uh, in the first instance, just as much as I can, you know, from, I guess, the computer and, and phone calls and um, research so that I can get kind of the real basics down and, and sort of know what I'm working with. And then um, once I kind of have those basics in place, that's when I try and go and do the research trips because then you can kind of talk to people about the more, yeah, the more kind of um, mundane stuff that, that really adds the flavor. So, you know, yeah, where, you know, where do you do your shopping and what is the school system like? 
you know, what, when you were growing up here and what kind of jobs do people do when they, you know, when they leave school here and, um, you know, I don't know, like kind of what kind of vehicles you're driving and it's, it's those little kind of on the ground details, I guess, that um, just help to be able to drop them in and hopefully make it feel sort of authentic and recognisable to the readers. It sounded to me when you were describing it then, like you approach it very much like a journalist then, if you're going out and talking to people on the street and taking notes, is that is that the way you feel about it? Yeah, you know, actually, yeah, I think that's exactly, yes. I mean, you would know, you would know that um, yourself. I mean, and actually that's a really good way to describe it because I think, you know, especially when you're working on a newspaper or something, you know, you don't leave, you don't leave the newsroom with, well, ideally, you don't leave the newsroom without kind of knowing the basics of the story so you try and kind of get a good grasp a decent grasp of it and then you go out and try and get the quotes and the color and the you know the interview with the neighbor or whatever um so you're not having to ask those people the basics you can actually ask them kind of the color and the real personal intimate stuff um without having to sort of waste time on on stuff you could have got elsewhere mm -hmm. so, yeah so that is that actually is exactly the way I approach it really and is the idea that you don't want people to know where the town is exactly that it could be any small town by the sea or out in the outback or do you not mind that people think oh I recognize that place oh you know it's a bit of both is actually because I I think ideally the, I always fictionize fictionalize this the uh the town or the setting um partly because I think I think it's just it's just fairer to the region you know I mean I think if you're going to do a, a a whole fictionalized book with events that never happened it's it's for me, I don't know, it's just best. It just Put a meth better. murder in somebody's town. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you know, if, if you're a town that's maybe only got, you know, I don't know, one one of this type of business or one school or whatever, you know, it's, you know, it, it's sort of, um, I think it's just a lot easier all around to fictionalise it. But at the same time, um, I also, you know, ideally you want people to think, you know, that, that that place is just like where I grew up or just like, yeah, that place I went on holiday. So so you sort of go for that middle ground where it's fictionalized, but it's also um, ideally very recognizable as well. Well, I think it's astonishing, Jane, because I think we can all hear that you did not grow up in this country. I can still hear it in your accent. And I know that you didn't grow up in this country, but your, your ability to evoke the Australian childhood is astonishing for somebody who didn't experience it firsthand. And I'm assuming that m made you a very good journalist as well. Now you have children who are experiencing an Australian childhood, you can probably get more of a sense of how close you are to it. It really is quite remarkable. Okay, and actually, well, actually, I did actually, um, I did actually live here for a few years when I was a child, like not for. Um, Tell us about that. Yeah, so, um, so I was here for, so I lived here between the age for six years, um, from the age of eight to fourteen. So I did actually go to the primary school and a little bit of secondary school, and, um, and six years, like now, I, I mean, now you know, for me, six years just goes by, you know, in like a blink of an eye, like it's nothing. But, um, I think you know, at that age, six years is, is quite a formative. You know, it feels like a, it feels like longer. It feels like a long time. But I think then, having gone back to the UK and and sort of finished secondary school and gone to uni and worked as a journalist out there for a while, um, I mean, one of the, the things I sort of quite often, you know, reference is, is then coming back to Australia as an adult and 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 seeing places that I kind of half remembered as a child or experiences or, or products or whatever it was that I kind of had these sort of hazy memories of. Um, and just seeing, I guess, how well they aligned, like if they were, if I was accurate in my recollection or if they were, and quite often they were sort of a bit different, especially the places and things. And I think that made me really, I guess, tune in to a lot of those differences and um, be, I guess, more aware of the, you know, what, I guess what makes Australia, you know, what it is. Um, and then working, you know, yeah, work as a journalist really helps. You, you are get, getting in front of all those conversations that people are having just in their day-to-day -day lives and, you know, you, you, I suppose you're across kind of what the, the regional issues are and things like that. So that definitely helps as well. Can you imagine yourself writing a novel about any other country? I can't at this stage, no. I mean, I, I think I think if I were to sort of leave Australia and live somewhere else, which I mean, I haven't really got any plans to do at all, but I think maybe then I could probably if I if I was living somewhere else, I think then maybe almost certainly I might because... um again, for all the reasons like the research and just kind of being able to sort of um, visualize it really well. And um, so, um, but no, I think, I think that's probably what it would take. I think I would have to be living, actually living somewhere else. 
Well, you were one of the first writers actually who was able to convince the world to read about Australian landscapes and just not have to set it in the United States. So everyone is grateful to you for that, I'm, I'm sure. T tell us also about the way um, COVID knocked your career around, if at all. Were you, was there travel you were not able to do? Was it harder to work when everyone was at home? How, how did you adapt to the last two years? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've all got, you know, I mean, everybody's had their, everybody has their own sort of, you know, kind of journey through the last couple of years. And they, um, I think for me, the, the biggest thing, I suppose, was, um, was last year when the survivors was coming out that was you know when victoria was in um Melbourne was in sort of the hard lockdown and so um a lot of all the kind of publicity and everything all the tour and everything that we'd normally do around the book just just was just all done remotely um so um it, at the time that felt like a really big sort of learning curve i say now you know being on zoom is like second nature to i think you know so many of us um so that was a really big thing but i mean i was really again like really grateful to the way the readers still embrace the book, even without having all those kind of, I guess, face-to-face -face opportunities and things. Um, you know, people still kind of went and bought it, which was, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, amazing. And I'm really grateful to everybody who did that. And um, and then, yeah, and then this time, um, the this time I was actually writing a book at the, at the time and um, then, you know, then the, the daycare's closed and then that <laughs> got back. <laughs> So sort of still got a bit of a little trauma, kind of, kind of residual trauma from that um, sort of couple of months. Um, but because uh, I've, got, I've, got I've got two kids and they're five and two um, and they um, don't really like mix with writing that well. So okay, were you doing any homeschooling as well? Or was there homeschooling? No, thank God. No, they were, they were too young for that. So it was more just entertaining, I suppose. Um, but, um, you know, but I, I mean, I mean, everybody, everybody who works has had that kind of issue, haven't they? So I suppose it just, I just did what everybody else did and just sort of tried to, to, to work around it. And, and in a way, it actually, weirdly, in a way, it actually, um, I found it quite enjoyable to then go into the book because it was this kind of COVID-free world. And it was just, you know, a place where in my imagination, the daycares were still open. And, you know, and so <laughs> it was, it was actually sort of, um, so I didn't actually find the writing, I didn't find the writing that hard because I was, I was quite enjoying just being able to kind of think about that instead. I think it was more, just like many people, it was just more the time issue um, is, was, was the hardest thing for me. And you just mentioned there a COVID free world. I know that uh, was going to be my next question actually, a lot of writers are struggling with what to do about COVID in their novels. So. Do you mention it? Do you not mention it? Some people have tackled it head on and they're living in a COVID world in their novel. What did you decide to do? Is it before or after or it just didn't happen at all? Oh, so I just went down the, I just, I just it, it just does, does not exist in, you know, it's, and, and I think, yeah, it was, that was a really, that was a really easy choice for me. I never even really thought seriously about including it. And for a few reasons, I mean, partly because I think all my novels are kind of set in a, um, a kind of timeless presence you know I mean they're basically after the advent of smartphones there's sort of modern technology but I think really any of them could exist anything from sort of really yeah, 2009 onwards um, I think is kind of a, a reasonable time frame and there's, there's never any events that sort of pin has it pinned anything to a year or anything like that so I, I just I thought you know there's, there's absolutely nothing why start now? Why on earth would I start now pinning, pinning my books to a specific year? Um, and secondly, I just think that um, people's COVID experiences are, are so vastly different. I mean, I can't, you know, I can sit here and complain about not having the time to write my novel at home where there's, there's people who, who've you know, lost their businesses or lost, lost loved ones and had really very different experiences from mine. So I just think, I don't know how you can even begin to capture the huge broad range of experiences people have had with that. Mm. And perhaps in a, in a book where, imagine that COVID had gone on, God forbid, and you weren't able to get on planes or you weren't able to meet people for a coffee or your characters were not able to go to the pub or all of those basic things that people do in your books that for the past two years haven't been possible. So you just kind of write around that as if it didn't, as if we never did that. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think I just, you know, um, I mean, I just set the book like it was 2018, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a year. That's a blime year. I remember launching into 2020 thinking this is going to be so much fun and then it was such a catastrophe. <laughs> 
so, so tell me about that. What, what can you tell us about the book that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, not a lot, I guess, because it's, it's, it's really, it's really just gone into sort of the editorial stage. So the people who sort of professionally need to read it are only just kind of getting their hands on it. So I should probably give them the courtesy of letting them kind of cast their eye over it before I start, you know, <laughs> kind of banging on about it in public. But um, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, I, look, I, I mean, personally, I, I really like it. I think it's, you know, it's, it was a really fun one to work on. And, um, you know, it's, um, I think, I think if you know people have liked the other ones, I think um, I, I think it's the kind of yeah, like a feel and story and characters and things that they'll be, you know, will be will be drawn to equally. And um, you know, it's um, yeah. I mean, I guess you know, what more can I really say at this stage? Probably not much, unfortunately. Probably not without giving anything <laughs> away. Uh, one one thing that intrigues me, um, Jane, is that sometimes you write a book. And then the next thing I know, I'm reading about very similar things in the real world. And I, I know that, for example, in, in, in The Dry, and I won't give too much away for people who haven't read it, but there's this, a trauma at the heart of that book and the uh, inability of, of a woman to talk about her trauma too. Um, and that is true of some of your other books without giving too much away. Are you sometimes surprised by how modern times catch up with your writing? Or is it the other way around and you feel... That these things are always happening and we're just not talking about them. Yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting sort of question because I think um, you know one of the, the big things for me about I guess the themes and, and events that sort of take place often is that um, they um, I try and let them be character led. So I, I never sort of approach a book thinking you know I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna include this type of event or this sort of kind of conflict or, or whatever it is because. Um, I, I just it, it's just not quite the way the process works for me and I, I think it's more you know I, I have this sort of story in mind and then from there I'm thinking well okay what's yeah yeah what like I said what has brought people to this point and and often you know it does involve sort of maybe trauma in the past or some sort of conflict in their current lives and so I'm kind of trying really hard to think about um, you know this character of you know, this age, this person in this situation, having grown up in this way, like what kind of things are bothering them and what's keeping them awake at night and what, what is going to be really troubling for them or what kind of things will they have experienced? And I guess it's those, and I think quite a, yeah, a lot about that. Like I really spent a long time trying to work out what's been going on in their lives off the page. Um, and I think from there, it's where the themes and the sort of, things sort of tend to develop um and I guess ideally those are things that then a bit like the setting they're they're maybe they're non-specific but recognizable because we do see them you know read about them in the news and maybe talk about them to some degree in the community and things so and and ideally I, I guess I hope they sort of feel real because they are sadly often like recognizable for that reason so that's kind of how those things tend to emerge within the book. I, I try not to, like, I, well, I never knowingly sort of shoehorn anything in because I think this is really, you know, very obvious to readers and it doesn't really ever work. And I, so I try and really let it be, come out through the characters and what I think they've been through. So then the books are not about, in your view, a theme. They're not about, for example, sexual assault or gambling addiction or anything else. They're about a character. The character comes to you first. Is that a, a fair way of describing that? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, beyond the kind of the, that initial hook about what what what's kind of going to be, I guess, the conflict at the heart of this book, um, and even then though, what has that what has caused that conflict? And that's when you're starting to kind of build out the themes, and and some of them kind of take longer to emerge than others. I mean, some of them will be, um, I mean, you know, kind of obvious, I guess, straight away in terms of when you think about what people have been through. But other ones, for sure, like they kind of really only, you know, maybe in the drafting stage or the planning stage, you'll start, you'll start saying, well, why, yeah, why is this person acting like this? Why, why has he, yeah, why is he, is he like this to the people in his life? And, um, and I guess that's when, you know, I start to do a bit more of a deep dive into to what's maybe behind that. And are you sometimes you're surprised yourself by what has happened to your characters? Does it come to you like a bowl? Oh my goodness, this or that has happened to this person and it suddenly feels very obvious? Yeah, sometimes actually, like, I mean, I know that sounds a bit like, sometimes I hear authors say, oh, I mean, my character surprised me and, you know, and you think, well, you're the one at the computer, so really, how much does that happen? But, um, but I think it does really, because you, you sort of, 
sometimes like, you know, I'm kind of um, often like it'll be when I'm, yeah, when I'm not writing, when I'm kind of just walking home or whatever, and, and it'll just kind of be ticking away somewhere in my subconscious and someone think, oh, you know, that's, that's what they need to have done. That's what's happening. And, and it, it, it does sort of almost come out of just this kind of background noise, I think. Um, or sometimes, um, you know, I'll be trying to think of a way maybe into a chapter and, and I'll be thinking, you know, what's, I could, uh, you know, uh, how do I explain this? I could just, I could just start it. This person could just be getting in his car and driving off somewhere. But is there, what's he thinking about when he's getting into his car? Is he thinking about the time like his dad taught him to drive or thinking about the time he got into an accident when he was a kid or, you know, that sort of thing. And I mean, sometimes that opens up doors that I didn't expect. Like what, what relationship does this person have with the action they're doing now? And has something else ever happened like that to them in their life? So sometimes that does come out of, it feels like nowhere. It's probably just my subconscious because, as I said, you you are the writer and it is up to you. <laughs> so. I think one of the other things that is often said about your works, and and I, I couldn't I couldn't uh, agree with it more, is that your ability to open a book is with abso absolutely without peer, Jane. It's just magnificent. I mean, the opening scenes of the dry with the with the buzzing of the insects. I can still I feel like I've I've read it two minutes ago, I, it, although it was five years ago. And also I think uh, the opening scenes of, was it the, I think it was the lost man with the, with the grave and, and, and he's kind of making his way around the grave and you can sort of see the circle where he's been trying to stay in the shade. It's devastating. Your ability to open a book is just devastating. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you work really hard on that or is, do you find that that's where you're going to start from and you're gonna go from there? Yeah, no, I work really hard on it. And it comes quite late as well sometimes. So, um, I mean, I would never, um, I would never start kind of the planning process thinking where, what's my opening page going to be or what's the opening scene at all. Um, it's, it's really, I mean, I would say the whole thing was almost mapped out before I think, okay, so where, do, where do we start this? Like, how does this, how do we kind of go in? And sometimes, um, I guess, you know, like I was sort of touched on earlier, I try and think of like the most, I suppose, interesting, interesting thing that's go, that's going to kind of draw people in. And I think sometimes a bit of a temptation to kind of you don't want to you don't want to kind of burn all your good stuff straight away because you think, <laughs> oh well, you know, I still need good stuff in like chapter four. So should I kind of should I like kind of just use this all up on page one? And then I think, well, yes, because otherwise, you know, they've got to get past page one to get to chapter four. So I may as well just, you know, just go for it and just chuck it all Throw them in there into you know? the trauma. And it's just astonishing. Now, Jane, we've only got 20 minutes to go. And although I could, I could talk to you forever, I just think you're the most wonderful, wonderful writer of Australian <laughs> Um, fiction that we've produced in the last 20 years it's been oh. it's been marvelous reading your books I've had so much fun doing it but I know that people really want to ask you questions so I'm going to turn over to them and then I'll probably repeat the question back in case you don't get a chance to hear it okay okay thank over you. to the floor questions for Jane Harper you know they're going to be shy, so I've got to wait. For them. I know it's so nerve-wracking, isn't it? Have to, no, and you have to stand up and shout it out. I'm not going to ask something. God, I know you poor things. Um, no pressure. It's, I, I, I wouldn't want to do it either. <laughs> no pressure. Not one of you has a question. Oh, yes, of course they do. Now they've started. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Did you hear that, Jane? No, I sorry, I didn't hear any of that. Okay, so the question was, you lived in England for a very long time. Can you imagine specifically writing about England? Do you know, I don't, I don't think I can. Um, I don't think I can, and partly because of the reason very early on that I decided to write about Australia rather than the UK. Um, partly was because I was living here at the time. Um, and partly also because I feel like, um, I feel like the UK is like there's so many crime books in the UK. Like I, I can't think of any sort of real opportunity based in the UK. Um, I guess writing wise, I mean, obviously there will be some. There will be loads, but yeah, I, I struggle to think of anything that I have. I don't feel like I've already read like quite a few times over the years from lots of different authors. So, um, you know, to be honest, like going right back to the days of like when I was thinking about you know, the dry and what I'm going to write about, that was one of the really key reasons why I thought, no, I'm going to write a book set in Australia because um, I just think there's so much more opportunity and it's just a more interesting, like, environment. And, um, 
and things. Um, I mean, I would never obviously say that on an English, you know, virtual event. <laughs> I, I think the internet is worldwide. There's a clue in the there's a clue in the www bit. <laughs> we'll have to edit it out, Catherine. We'll have to edit it out. <laughs> One more question coming for you, Jane. Hold your spot there. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So the audience member is asking that those she, there's characters that you've created that she has absolutely loved, and she's wondering whether they will pop up in any of your other books. Yeah, good, it is a good question. Um, and I think the answer is probably maybe. Like, I guess never say never. I suppose it depends specifically, like, who, um, you know, I, I mean, some, some I would say probably no. Um, some I would think... Some of them I do think, you know, I could sort of see maybe not like a whole second life, like probably not like a whole nother book and things, but just um, I kind of wondered myself a little bit, like I wonder, you know, where they would be in a few years. And I, if I could do, if, if it's sort of, I, I think probably if it happened, it would be more of a kind of um, uh, like a passing reference, you know, like the, the story would be happening and then there'd be some sort of reference to, you know, a character from the past, I guess, um, from a past book with a little bit of an update for the readers. So a little bit of, a, I guess, kind of like a hidden kind of. Just, I think they yeah, call that an yeah. Easter egg. So it's a little surprise in the book for people who have read all the others think, hang on a minute, I know that person and they get a little thrilled from finding it. But the, it's actually interesting the way you approach your career that way, because so many people have their central character, their Miss Marple, if you will, and they take that character to all the different locations to do the different things. But you've resisted that. Yeah, and I think I think it, it comes down to a lot of it is, comes down to the way, I guess, the way the stories come to me. Um, so they're not, um, you know, like I said, you know, they're, they're not sort of character based, they're more based around, um, you know, like an event. And then it's quite, um, it, it's it's a bit challenging I think to back engineer that to that event maybe to then have a specific character um like I'm not saying it can't be done like I think it can be done like quite well you know but um I think often it's sort of a question when I'm starting to build out this world you know um there's just different people involved and 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 I think you know it's it's important to I guess you know, use the best characters to tell tell the story and um, so that that's I think that's the reason why really is just trying to tell the story in the best possible way and often that is just you know it involves new characters really. Do you get any pressure from your publisher saying but your readers really want to know what happened to x or y? Um, no 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 I don't I mean the publishers are you know I, like I have great publishers and they're really you know supportive and they they sort of um, I think you know sort of support me to kind of I guess let the ideas go where they're going to go to get the best results um and I think you know I think for me sort of you know I, I just I suppose I just like writing a book is it's such it's such a massive effort like it's so it's so time consuming it takes ages and it's, it really is like like it's really really hard work to do it and um so I think you I, you know you, I'd always want to be producing the best possible book I could and um you know, I, I couldn't just sort of go down a road of a character just for the sake of, you know, it was commercially beneficial or whatever. I think, it, you know, I can't put all that effort in without thinking, you know, this is this is really the best possible way I can tell this story and, and giving it the best, you know, outcome and experience for the reader. Well, how do you feel about fan fiction? Like what if someone comes along, takes one of your characters and does like a Twilight Fifty Shades of Grey style? You know, oh, like, I mean, how do you feel? I would love to do. I, can't, I, I would... I would I would, you know, um, write and read that at night. I mean, <laughs> send it to me. <laughs> I'm going to take a question from the floor from Liz. I'm sorry, these are the Zoom questions, so I'm reading them. Was it daunting to be interviewed by Ian Rankin? Oh, it was. Yes. Think, yeah, it was actually. Um, I think um, he interviewed me um, in when I was in the UK, in, in Edinburgh. Um, and um, like it was actually, yes, because I, I mean, I sort of, you know, I'm, I mean, I've sort of 
seen in ranking books around like you know my parents house and you know for years and things and um and they're really big fans they were very they were very starstruck I have to say they could, actually couldn't make the event um because, because they were away but they they nearly cancelled their holiday in order to come and then meet Ian Rankin um so, so um yeah it is and it's quite bizarre sometimes like I sometimes when authors that I really admire I've read for years it becomes apparent that they have read my book or are aware you know of kind of me as an author and and um and that is um yeah it is I still I still find it really and I still I, I always miss the opportunity like I'm too I'm too shy to then kind of strike up like any kind of friendship or relationship with them so I just kind of pretend I don't I haven't seen the tweet or whatever because I'm too, <laughs> I don't really know what to say back <laughs> And I have I have another message from you here from a Karen who says loved seeing you it loves she loved seeing her hometown of Beulah on the screen and so I'm thinking to myself are we meant to know that it's Beulah where they filmed it is this a well known thing it, it is, is a well known thing oh good okay good. yeah Beulah Beulah is um I'll tell you what Beulah Beulah is the the best place they have they have embraced this so if you go to Beulah on your next um regional Victorian holiday um Carolyn you can go and stand in the main street of Beulah on painted footsteps and recreate the movie post and look over your shoulder so oh. the best Eric Banner pose <laughs> and get your photograph taken as though you were Eric Banner on the movie poster yeah, but do I and, get the cuddle as well or no is that I don't, <laughs> I don't know I think that's that's a that's a that's an extra um but, and, and I think I think I'm right to say so on the um on the way into town they have now they have like the kind of welcome to Beulah and then below it says home of the dry um oh, it's gorgeous so, so it's so Beulah has just you know they they've they've sort of like absolutely leaned into this whole kind of you know movie destination um, and good on them. What and Karen, and Karen could probably answer this for us, but she's not in the room. Is it a is it a tiny town? Like a, like is it just a handful of people? Or I think it's, yeah. I mean, it's pretty. It is like I mean, I'm not sure how how it compares with say the other sort of regional towns around there. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's not there's not. Um, I, I mean, I think it's like a fairly you know, thriving community. But um, I, I, yeah, it is it is small because they had they did actually film the film in quite a few places. So I think there were about twelve towns in the end that were stitched together yeah, to make yeah. one town because they needed different things. So the pub somewhere else and the church is somewhere else. And um, but Beulah was um, was a real, a real starring role in that. And and a lot of the locals came out and were extras and you know actually rented out their houses and all kinds of things to sort of support this film being made. So I have a real. Um, I have a real soft spot for for. Oh, that's for fabulous. Now I've got another question on the floor. In fact, I've now got three or four, so I'm going to have to <laughs> race through them. So everyone's found their courage, Jane. <laughs> so I'll take the lady in the front, please. Did you hear any of that, Jane? The question, no, I didn't. No. Um, the, re the reader is uh, praising you for avoiding some of the cultural stereotypes that we see about country Australians. And she's wondering whether you have to go back, like do, do those little tropes sneak in and you have to go and remove them all with a little little knife or do you, or, or do you not, uh, never tempted by them? Oh, no, I think absolutely. I think, you know, I, I, um, yes, I, th I think, you know, we all kind of, often fall into sort of this kind of stereotype pigeonhole type thinking. Um, I think just, you know, naturally you sort of, you know, lean, some, find yourself kind of, I mean, that's why they are stereotypes and pigeonholing and, and things. So um, yeah, absolutely. Like I think, um, you know, and even with each book, like I become more conscious of, um, of, of things that I, I guess, you know, you think, you know, in years to come, what, what will, you know, what will people think, you know, looking back and, um, and what will my children think when they are old enough to read these books? And so, um, you know, wherever I can, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 obviously I'm not sort of perfect in that as I think no author would be. And, um, but, um, and it's probably things I don't even realize that I'm doing, but, um, wherever I notice it, wherever I can, I absolutely try and, you know, yeah, tr definitely try not to kind of fall into that trap if I can. All right, and we have a lady in the back and then this one in the front, and then I think we're going to have to call it a quits, aren't we? We're, I'm getting notes, just be quiet. Yes. <laughs> I 
uh, the reader is asking, she says that you're, she's asking about genre, that the dry has its feet in crime, but it also has its feet in psychological thriller. Is there a decision that's made by you to fall into one or the other or to straddle the two? I don't really think about um, that too much um, when I'm writing, like, you know, where, where is this going to fall, like on a bookshop shelf, for example, or um, because, I th I, again, it comes back to just trying to write the best book that I can. And for me, um, I try and write books that I would like to read, as you know, as I say quite often, but that that is sort of books that, you know, where it's, it's the crime is almost kind of peripheral. Like really what interests me most is like the ripple effects on communities and, and yeah, what's, what's brought people to this moment and what's, um, I guess, yeah, the aftermath. I think as a journalist as well, like that was a real big thing when you go out to things that have happened and, and you see these people left behind. And sometimes you go back a year later to kind of anniversary story and you say, my God, like, wow, yeah, this is this absolutely kind of put your life on a completely different path. And that has always been quite profound to me. So I think that's something I definitely like to, to tr sort of try and bring out if I can. And I've got time for one more and it's the lady in the second row here. So the reader is asking if you have a manuscript in the bottom drawer anywhere. I think she means one that didn't get published. Am I right? And she's also asking, do you have one idea or many ideas on the go? Yeah, well, great questions tonight, everybody. Thank you for these. They're really good ones. Um, so no, I've never I've never written a book that hasn't been published um, because the, the first book I wrote was The Dry. Um, yeah, that was like literally the first sort of you know, it, it took me a long, long time to kind of work up, I think, to finding that time and motivation to actually write a whole novel. Um, and I was fortunate, I think, that I had all those background skills as a journalist to then bring to that so that when I did actually do it, um, you know, I was a, you know, I've sort of been able to enjoy, I guess, the success that that's had. And then since then, I've always been on a contract. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 that's just kind of the books, I write a book and it gets edited and published. Um, and um, the second part of that was, do you have I have one idea on the go? At oh all? no, yeah, no. I, I only have I, I only have one idea. I, I know some authors like a well of ideas, and they sort of just pluck one out and you know have loads to choose from. Um, I think again because of the way I work, I, I sort of I have one. I think for a long, long time about what could it be? What could it be? And then something sort of sticks and it's sort of, this is quite a sticky idea and it, I keep coming back to it. And then I sort of work it up over like months and months and months and I'm building it out and testing it and refining it. Um, and then that's it. So now I've written this, this idea um, and now I have no more ideas. So now, so, so I have to think of another idea, but no, I, it's, 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 a, um, it's a one idea. It's, so if you only have one idea, don't despair. One idea is all you need. One, Just, one is all you need, you know? exactly. Now you can give me a one word answer to this, yes or no. The first and the third novels were set in the dry heat. And then the second one was in the damp. And then we've got the fourth, near the water. So does this mean book five is back to dust? Oh, um, no. No, oh, hello. I have to wrap up the session, Jane, because we've probably even talked over our hour or close to it. She. I've got a couple of minutes. Well, that well, that's good. So I can say a proper thank you because you are the, one of the most talented, but also one of the most generous writers in Australia. If you have an opportunity to see Jane on Twitter or on Instagram or on her TEDx talk, she is sharing so many of her tips and tricks. There is not an ounce of her that is not willing to help all of you who are keen to one day write a book and and you know maybe enjoy a modicum of her success. She's a remarkable. Um, woman, a tremendous writer, a huge talent. She's given her time again today to to discuss these issues with us. I can't thank her enough. She's 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 a wonder. She's just terrific. Thank, please thank her for us. Here comes Sue to say her goodbyes. I've also been asked to thank you, Caroline, for a fabulous interview. And to say, unfortunately, Jane, you're not here to sign books, but you are. Oh, really? And your books awesome. will be there. <laughs> so if you like to proceed to the bookshop, there are books to be signed if people would like to do so. But thank you both so much. Thank you again. You have a great night, Jane. Oh, thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. This has been really fun. Thank you for the great questions.